We had a long haul flight back from my sister's wedding, flying all the way from Heathrow in London to O'Hare, a little over eight hours in total. And we were trying to stay awake for as much of the flight as possible, attempting to recalibrate ourselves to Chicago time, which made it the perfect opportunity to watch some movies. Now, everyone has a different plain movie philosophy. There are those who return to their favorites. How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, Singing in the Rain, something familiar, soothing, doesn't require too much attention. Others, like my husband, take the opportunity to watch something a little trashy, not super well reviewed, maybe going with the latest low budget action flick. Noah was very proud to tell me he watched three over the course of the flight. I, however, gravitate toward what is arguably the worst category of movie to watch on a plane, Academy Award nominees. Now this is, I think, the worst category because these movies are not, by any stretch of the imagination, designed to be watched on a plane. These are films made for big screens and surround sound, not for teeny tiny monitors and barely discernible audio that's often drowned out by the ambient noise of the airplane. Yet I am who I am, and I inevitably use these flights as a chance to catch up on whatever Oscar-nominated movies I didn't catch in the theater. The last long-haul flight I was on, I watched two. First, I watched Elvis. A terrible choice. I mean, that's a movie that's all about music, and I really couldn't hear a thing. And then I watched After Sun, which is sonically the opposite of Elvis. It's a quiet, dimly lit, atmospheric film that I had to get about this close to the monitor to watch. And those experiences did nothing to dissuade me, and this time around I chose to watch Women Talking. It is a stunning film about faith, hope, change, and the nature of forgiveness and worth far more than the airplane ride viewing I gave it. Women Talking is an Academy Award nominated movie from this past year directed by Sarah Pauly. It's adapted uh, from the book of the same name by Miriam Toves. If you haven't seen it or heard about it, the movie is about the women living in an isolated, strict religious colony, none of whom know how to read or write or even find the location of their colony on a map. And these women and girls of all ages have been violently harmed by some of the men in the colony. And the movie follows the women as they make a decision about what they're going to do. They have three choices. They can do nothing, they can stay and fight, or they can leave. At the beginning of the film, a single sentence is shown on the screen. It reads, what follows is an act of female imagination. This act of imagination resonates on multiple levels. It first refers to the gaslighting that the women experienced. The women are initially told that their experiences are imagined. 
The men attempt to convince them that it's all happening in their mind. This act of imagination also refers to the book and the film themselves, which are based on real life events that occurred in a Mennonite colony in Bolivia. The book and the film are imaginative responses. As works of art, they explore what sorts of conversations and actions women in this situation might take. But acts of imagination, they're threaded throughout the film as the women talk about the decision, as they discern, they repeatedly imagine what futures they could live into. They imagine what it would mean to leave everything they've ever known. They imagine what it would mean to try and stay, knowing that they would have to live side by side with the perpetrators. And they also imagine what it would be like to really live their faith, to live their faith in an environment defined by pacifism and love rather than by violence and control. I was really taken with how, throughout the film, their faith practices help them imagine. Their faith is never taken for granted. These are women of deep and strong faith. They imagine together by singing a hymn when one of the women experiences a panic attack. Taking her back to a moment of trauma, they sing as a way to hold her and imagine healing with her. The women imagine together when they meditate on what is good. They make a list, sunshine, hay, stars. They imagine as a way to ground themselves. an act of female imagination. It strikes me that Christian discipleship is an act of imagination. Today's text from the Gospel of Matthew has discipleship at its heart. Those famous final verses, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, are an invitation to follow Jesus and to become a disciple. But there's a lead up to the invitation. Jesus actually starts with an admonishment. But to what will I compare this generation? He says. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. Last Sunday, Pastor Veronica talked about the children. I think there's some connection here. Jesus is talking about being in tune with what's going on. Being in tune with what the children, what the people need. And he's specifically calling out those in positions of power. Those in power, Jesus is saying, are not in tune with what's happening. They're out of sync. I think there's some connections we can make there. I also think that we can take this a bit more generally and apply it to the church as a whole. Use it as a rubric for ourselves because there are times when the church is not in tune with what's really going on. When the church fails to respond to what's going on outside its doors. So much so that we can fail to recognize God's messengers. It's been happening since the beginning. John came preaching repentance and people said, he has a demon. And Jesus came preaching abundance and the people said, he's a drunk. 
God's kingdom can sometimes seem simultaneously like too little and too much. Let's be honest. Sometimes we don't want to repent. We don't want to give stuff up. We like our stuff. We don't want to name our failures. We don't want to change the way that we live. And sometimes we don't want abundance. We don't want to invite everyone. We don't want to sit down with the most hated. We don't want to share. That's why discipleship is an act of imagination. We have to dream that something different is possible. We have to imagine an outcome where we do unburden our hearts, where we do have and share abundance, where we are in sync with the world around us. Jesus knows this. That's why he calls us to be like children. In today's text, he prays, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Remember when you were a child and the world didn't seem quite so rigid? You could be anything you wanted. You could be a chef, or a nurse, or a magician, or a cat, depending on the hour of the day. Children believe the impossible and they make it happen right before our eyes. A cardboard box is transformed into a rocket ship. An entire civilization is built from Legos. A tea party can bring together the unlikeliest of friends, the dolls, and the stuffed animals. Discipleship asks us to imagine. Like children, we're invited to dream something different. And doesn't that sound like a bomb to the soul? to be invited into a space of imagination. When was the last time you were invited to dream? To use your imagination. Jesus says, come to me all of you who are weary, who are weary of the status quo and the way things are. Come to me all who are carrying the weight of the world. Come to me. And let's name how things are. And let's imagine something different. I want to have us try it together, if you're willing. I invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to imagine that you're sitting somewhere comfortable. Maybe it's a big, squishy armchair in your house. Maybe it's somewhere on the point with the lake glistening in the sun. And I want you to imagine that Jesus comes and sits beside you. And you just sit for a moment in companionable silence. What does Jesus do? Does he reach out and take your hand? Or maybe place a hand on your back? Imagine that he says, come to me, weary one. I will give you rest. Imagine he asks you what your burdens are. What do you say? What do you share with him? 
How does it feel to know that he is listening deeply? Does it change anything in your body or your spirit or your mind? When you feel ready, open your eyes, come back to this space. That was holy imagination. And the thing about imagination is that what we imagine, it doesn't just stay in our minds. Our imagining, it permeates. It starts to permeate our choices and our interactions, and slowly but surely it builds a different reality. Neuroscience can back me up on this. What we think, what we dream, it changes the patterns of our brain. It changes us on a neurological level. That's powerful. And we need to harness that power. We're called to harness our discipleship power. And let me tell you, the world needs us to harness that discipleship power. Because there is so much hurt and there is so much fear. And we are at risk of becoming out of sync with what's really going on. Becoming out of sync with what God is trying to show us. We have to imagine a new way of living in creation. We have to. This way, it's killing us. We have to imagine totally new systems of taking care of each other. These ones, they're not working. We have to imagine what church is going to become. It's time. Discipleship asks us to be brave, for like the women in the film, we very well might be called to leave behind everything that we have known and walk into something that we cannot fully see. But Jesus promises that somehow, somehow his yoke, it's easy, and his burden is light, because while imagining something new is scary, it is so much easier than chaining ourselves to something that can no longer be. Discipleship is an act of faithful imagination. You are being given an invitation to dream and to yoke yourself with the creator of the universe. Will you follow? Amen. Amen.